going to be pertinent. Uh, but of course, we live in a generation and we live in a world that is so unbiblically taught and is so ignorant as to what God's word requires uh, that most of the instructions that have been uh, involved in the summer series this year, uh, they are completely uh, unaware of. And it is a wake-up call and it is something new uh, for them to hear. And in many ways, they might be hearing it, you might be hearing it uh, for the first time. And this topic this evening is no different. Uh, wisdom and alcohol. Wisdom and alcohol. Looking in uh, to the book of Proverbs to understand what God has taught us, what he has instructed of us uh, regarding the topic of alcohol. Uh, now concerning the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs is uh, unique. It is very applicable. It is very practical in daily living. If we were to uh, try to better, uh, you know, find encouragement and edification as to how we can apply God's word in different situations and in different aspects of our daily life, things that we all come across on a daily basis, we could go to the book of Proverbs and find instruction therein. Uh, the book of Proverbs is also a great source of spiritual meditation. Uh, I know of preachers who uh, make the decision to read through the book of Proverbs a chapter a day, uh, and it works out to be about a chapter uh, you know, a day per month. So you read the book of Proverbs through in a month. This preacher here strives to live up to that. Uh, it is also a book wherein uh, even the Jewish people, the Jewish children, the young boys, recognized it as likened unto a textbook. Because young people certainly are uh, more sometimes tempted and more bombarded with certain types of sins and certain types of uh, temptations and lifestyles that are presented to us within the book of Proverbs compared to maybe more uh, mature adults. Uh, you think about the book of John, 1 John chapter 2, where John mentions their uh, fathers and young men and little children. Uh, different stages within one's spiritual life. Well, certainly young people, those who are first learning about uh, what it means to be a child of God or what it means to even become a Christian and what it means in regards to what they're going to have to give up and how they're going to have to uh, buckle down and apply God's law, they can look into the book of Proverbs. So it's no surprise that the Jewish people indeed uh, would use this book likened unto a textbook for their young men. And so when we think about the topic of alcohol, we're certainly going to find instructions within this book. Uh, however, it's not only within the book of Proverbs, but just like all of these topics, uh, the entire Bible is a book of wisdom. And we're going to study from the Bible. The Bible is its greatest commentary. And we're going to see how all throughout the text, from Genesis to Revelation, we can find scriptures that instruct us and teach us as to how we can behave as to how we can respond regarding the topic of alcohol. So before we get in uh, to looking at these specifics, let's first try to understand a little bit about wisdom. What is wisdom? James gives us a description of wisdom in uh, James chapter 3, as well as Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to begin with Paul's comparison in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And notice here the two differences, the two different types of wisdom that are presented in these two texts. First, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning there in verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Drop down to verse 27 beginning. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption." That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Paul here makes a distinction via inspiration as he's writing here to these Corinthian brethren regarding two different types of wisdom. There's wisdom that's rooted in the things that are, note the end of verse 28, that is things that are established in worldly norms, things that are physical, that are temporal in nature. There is that type of wisdom. But then there is another type of wisdom that is presented here. And that is the wisdom of 
God. Notice, for example, verse 21 in the very beginning, as well as uh, verse 28, we are brought unto wisdom, made us unto wisdom, rather, verse 30. There is the wisdom of God, and then there is the wisdom of men. The wisdom of men cannot comprehend, cannot understand the wisdom of God. And in this very passage, in this very chapter, what Paul is dealing with is the resurrection, the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the wisdom of the world says, no, no, no. Jesus, God in the flesh, Matthew chapter 1, 21 through 23, wait a second. He died? He was buried? God? No, that doesn't make any sense. God can't die. God can't be buried. That's foolishness. That's what the wisdom of the world teaches. But the wisdom of God, the focus on that which is not temporary, the focus on that which is not physical, extends beyond the wisdom of man. See, men just see that which is physical. Men is concerned with what's right in front of his face. But the wisdom of God is eternally minded. It is a characteristic of God. And so the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection is an eternal focus whereby men can be saved. And so men who are too wise in their own physical mindset cannot see the blessing that is in the gospel whereby they can be saved through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We likewise see a very similar comparison that James gives us in James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Notice with me here, beginning in verse 15. James here, of course, is dealing with wisdom. Some folks have called this the Proverbs of the New Testament. And in verse 15 of chapter 3, James writes, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. What is that? Verse 14. If ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. It is physical in nature. Verse 16, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Wisdom that is temporary in nature. Wisdom that is concerned with making the right moves uh, making the right decisions, choosing the right paths in order to bring about that which is most physically beneficial in the moment. That's the wisdom that is not from above. That is earthly wisdom. But godly wisdom, verse 17, wisdom that is from above, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. There is a concern, there is a care, there is an interest, there is an insight, there is a judgment that extends far beyond this physical immediate context and rather is concerned with something far more eternally important, and that is salvation. Wisdom is from above. That is the wisdom that we are concerned with. And so how then do we get wisdom that is from above? How are we able to grow in wisdom? How are we able to increase in wisdom? Of course, James will tell us in chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, that we can pray for it. Indeed, we can. He explains there in that context that trials and tribulations will enable us to work patience, to learn what it means to be wise. In other words, learn what it means to look beyond this physical world. Paul will say, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We do not Live, we are not concerned with the physical, but are looking beyond it to the eternal. So how then do we increase and grow in wisdom? Number one, we must fear the Lord. We must fear the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 1 and in verse 7, in the very beginning and introduction of this book, I'm sure this is something that has probably been covered in every single lesson as it needs to be. But we see here the Proverbs writer, Solomon writing, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. In order for one to understand what it means to grow in wisdom, one must fear, above all, the Lord. 
Folks, we have a hard time understanding even what it means to fear anymore. We live in a generation and in a society where when misbehavior occurs, when wickedness occurs, when unrighteousness occurs, not only is it rarely responded to with appropriate punishment, but oftentimes it is even glorified. So the very concept and idea of what it means to be fearful is something that we do not totally understand as a generation. We don't know what it means to fear because our parents have not taught us most of the time, have not brought us, brought us up under a, a disciplined atmosphere whereby we are fearing the paddle, we are fearing the beating, we are feed, uh, fearing the discipline that they're going to inflict upon us for disobedience. We have not been raised up and brought up in a school system whereby we are taught to fear authority. And we're not brought up in a government system where we're taught to fear the authority. And so the very idea of fear is something we could spend the rest of tonight on learning more about so that we could understand what it means to grow in wisdom. To understand fear. Jesus will speak to this topic in Matthew chapter 10. And in verse 28, he says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Folks, if we're going to grow in wisdom in any topic, we have to better understand and grow in our fear for the Lord. Not fear in losing our worldly pleasures, not fear in the possibility that we might lose our worldly luxuries. Not fear that we might lose our job or, or maybe uh, come down with some kind of health complication. But fearing the Lord. Fearing that which has eternal consequences. Jesus here is instructing that during his earthly ministry. If we're going to grow in wisdom... The wisdom that we care about growing in wisdom from above, we must grow in our fear for God. Number two, we must grow in hearing God. We must grow in hearing God. Proverbs chapter 2, Solomon will deal with this very issue in verse 6 and state where wisdom ultimately comes from. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Paul will write to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning of verse 16. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. In other words, all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture, all that which we have in the text comes from the Lord, comes from his mouth. So if we are going to grow in wisdom, we need to go to that which the Lord has given us, the Bible. Now, folks, we study a lot of things. Maybe not the way studies used to occur. But we sure don't have a hard time studying our Twitter account. We don't have a hard time studying our Facebook accounts and looking up people that we knew 25 years ago. We don't have a hard time studying the politics of the day. We don't have a hard time studying UGA football and what's going to happen with this new coach from Alabama. We'll dig in deep to learn more about those kinds of topics. Because see, sometimes folks will say, well, see, I just don't have time to study. I just don't have time to sit down and hear what the Lord has to say. I don't have time to come to Wednesday night Bible class. I don't have time to wake up early enough to study my Bible or stay up late enough to study my Bible. I don't have time enough to come Sunday evening or Sunday morning for Bible study. I don't have time for those kinds of things. Well, do you have time for other things in your life? Do you really want to sit down and break down your daily schedule? Because I'm sure we can find some time together as to whether or not you could be prioritizing to hear the Lord. But again, it goes back first to whether or not you fear God or you fear maybe the social embarrassment that you don't know who the new Georgia football coach is and all the details about it. Folks, it's not an issue of time. It's not an issue of work. It's an issue of heart, what we care about most. If we're going to grow in wisdom, we have to grow 
in our study and in our knowledge of God's Word. Folks, we just don't know it anymore. We don't know it like we used to as a brotherhood. I didn't live during those days, but I've heard stories. Poke them in a scripture comes out. Courtroom needs a Bible. They don't have one. They call a member of the Church of Christ to come up because they know the Bible frontwards and backwards. Folks, we have brethren on their deathbed right now who have memorized tons of Scripture. Know it in and out. Growing in wisdom. If we're going to grow in wisdom, we need to fear God. But we also need to hear God. What does he have to say? Number three, we need to seek God. We need to seek him. Notice chapter four in Proverbs. Verse seven there, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and with all thy getting, get understanding. Folks, it doesn't sound like to me that God is saying, well, you know, wisdom's a secondary thing. You don't really need to be wise. As long as you've been baptized for the remission of your sins, your Bible can just... Sit right on over there. And, you know, wisdom is something for older folks. Maybe later on in years, you'll, you know, figure out some wisdom here and there. Folks, Solomon here is writing his son. Get wisdom with all thy getting. God wants us to pursue it. God wants us to seek it. God wants us to long for it and live in such a way, recognize we can't live without it. Student was asking his philosophy teacher millennia ago, how do I grow in wisdom? He took his head, oftentimes they'd study near water, brought him down to the creek and buried his head under water and left it there for about a minute. Student started struggling to come up, couldn't come up. Finally, the philosopher let go. He said, what did you do that for? He said, how badly did you want air when you were down there? He said, that's all I was thinking about. He said, that's how you get wisdom. Folks, if we start recognizing that we cannot live before God without wisdom, we will seek it and long for it like he has commanded us to. The New Testament tells us something very similar in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and this will enter us into our topic this evening. Notice with me, beginning there in verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein as excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Folks, wisdom is not an option. Wisdom is a commandment. And we must get it. And in this very context, what Paul is dealing with by inspiration is a congregation that was primarily Gentile. Note chapter 2, beginning in verse 12 and following. They didn't understand, they didn't comprehend what it meant to truly worship and seek the Lord. Coming from their idolatrous background, they were under the impression that in order to seek deity, one needed to become in an intoxicated, mystical state whereby they might begin to see certain visions and uh, dream certain things and have experiences that maybe they could not even recall, but it was only then that they were able to truly contact and worship deity. And what Paul is teaching them is something far different than what they were used to doing. He tells them to not be drunk with wine. Do not drink wine, but rather be filled with that which the Spirit has taught. Be filled with the Spirit. It's a command. If you're going to be filled with the Spirit, that means you're going to intend and actually 
uh, engaging in an activity whereby you are going to be filled with us with the spirit it's not just something that occurs it's not something that you're just walking down the street and it happens but it's a command you are to go and be filled with the spirit the spirit has delivered all truth via inspiration john chapter 16 and verse 13 it's been given by God, as we've already noted, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. It's in the Bible. It's the scripture. God tells us, don't be drunk with wine, but rather be filled with the word of God. Folks, alcohol is, when you consider this passage, the antithesis of what it means to grow in spirituality. It inhibits us from our mindset and our physical capabilities to being able to serve and strive after the Lord. And unfortunately, this is something, this is a topic that our brotherhood is adamant about rejecting and furthering falsehoods instead. And so we're going to consider some topics tonight, some points tonight, as we think about alcohol. And we're going to consider it in light of some of those falsehoods. We're going to consider it in light of the immediate context within the scripture. And we're going to consider it in light of how we actually make application to the text so that we can avoid alcohol. Alcohol, first of all, is a socially unacceptable practice. Drinking and partaking of alcohol. Now you might think for just a moment, well, I've heard before that there's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol if it's under a social context. I, I didn't think there was anything wrong if, you know, some friends were gathered around and, you know, we were going to drink some alcohol. I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. Does the Bible deal with that? Well, yes, it does. Yes, it does. And so we're going to apply fearing God, hearing God, and seeking God to this topic of socially drinking. If wisdom is to fear God, if wisdom is to hear God, and if wisdom is to seek God, then let's go through that process, let's go through that systematic order in order to understand what the Bible teaches us regarding the topic of social drinking. Number one, fearing God. What do you mean fearing God? Well, what's the opposite of fearing God? Fearing who? Man. Why would I fear my fellow man in comparison to God when it comes to social drinking? Well, folks, I think that one's pretty easy to answer. Maybe I've made up my mind. Maybe I've recognized that the scriptures do indeed deal with alcohol. But when I get around certain friends and in certain occasions and certain circumstances, you know, I fear a lot more what they think. And I fear a lot more whether or not they're going to think I'm strange or weird or odd because I'm not engaging in the same practice they're engaging in. So my fear regarding my reputation would then trump my fear regarding my eternal stance with God. Does the Bible deal with this? Absolutely. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Look with me beginning there in verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered us, suffered for us rather, in the flesh, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Notice what's being prepared for us here. Did Christ suffer? Could Christ have avoided suffering? Absolutely. Let's think about that as we go on. Verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. Peter says, indeed, there was a time when you used to engage in drinking parties. You were drinking alcohol in the midst of others, 
But now that you are no longer called under that world, under that lifestyle, but have been called by the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, obedience to the gospel, you now live under Christ. So think about him and the suffering that he went through to remain loyal to the will of God. He gave up his life. So therefore, the fact that they think it's strange that you don't engage in these sinful, wicked, unrighteous practices any longer should not be something that affects you. Because you're no longer living according to their will. You're living according to the will of God. And so even if it means you have to suffer to the point of physical death as like Christ, it shouldn't concern you. However, in this very context, and in the context that we're discussing regarding social drinking, we're not talking about physical destruction. We're talking about social destruction. We're talking about our reputation being destroyed. Now, wait a second. I don't want to not drink because if I don't drink, my friends are going to think I'm strange. Well, folks, do I fear my friends thinking I'm strange or do I fear the Lord condemning me? Which one is it? Folks have always struggled with seeking the praise of men over the praise of God, seeking to save face, that is to save their reputation uh, over and of greater importance than saving their relationship and their status with the Lord. This very thing was dealt with as Christ was on the earth, as he was teaching and instructing, as he was working his works and instructing the people. Some folks, well, they were too afraid to give their life to Christ. They were more fearful of the reputation that they would lose from their fellow peers. John chapter 12, John writes this out for us, beginning there in verse 42. It says, nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Folks, to say social drinking is okay is completely illogical. Because what it's saying is it's not okay to drink not socially. But if it means that you have to save face, save your reputation, and be in good standing with your peers, then go ahead and engage in sin. Folks, that doesn't make any sense. And we see it rebuked in Scripture in multiple occasions. Fearing the Lord gives us the answer. Social drinking is not wise and is against the Lord. Social drinking, what is the conclusion that we're going to draw when it comes to hearing the Lord? Well, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Notice with me there, beginning in verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Folks, God is writing. God is rather giving here Paul as he's writing a list of those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And within that list, we see drunkards included. But likewise, we see many other attributes, many other lifestyles that are rejected and that uh, would keep one from inheriting the kingdom of God. And when we go through this list, in no way would we ever make the case that these areas and these items uh, and these practices and behaviors would be okay if it was done in a social setting. Can you imagine for a moment someone saying, well, it's okay to commit fornication in a social setting. It's okay to commit idolatry in a social setting or be an adulterer in a social setting or be a thief in a social setting. Folks, God's word, when it comes to engaging in a sinful practice just because others are involved, never authorizes that practice. As a matter of fact, in the book of Proverbs, go with me to Proverbs chapter 1, we see a case where one there 
is being tempted, a situation is being presented where sin is being put before uh, this one, the son, and it's a social setting of sin. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. Folks, this is a case of social murder, social covetousness. Hey, we want to go commit some evil. We want to go create chaos and murder someone and steal from them. Won't you come join us? That's like making the case that a gang, a murderous, robbing gang, is acceptable in the sight of the Lord because it's social. Folks, it's illogical and it makes no sense. Notice there, verse 15. My son, walk not in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. We're going to deal with that a little bit later. But it's clear. You don't engage in this kind of behavior. You stay far away from it. Hearing God's word, it's quite plain that social drinking is not something that is wise. As a matter of fact, in chapter 20 of Proverbs, in verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. Notice, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. When it comes to hearing the commands of God, when it comes to hearing the scriptures, there is no case that we can make that God authorizes the consumption of alcohol. Now, unfortunately... Our brethren, and yes, I say our brethren, will ignore those verses, and this is where wisdom comes in when it comes to seeking the Lord. And they'll try to find loopholes and justification for engaging in social drinking. We don't need to go any further. We've already seen what the scriptures teach. But see, if someone was approaching the word of God Isogeting, that is to put in God's word what they want to be there and then taking it out. In other words, I'm going to put in my will into God's word. I'm going to go to God's word and find out what I want to hear and that's what I'm going to see. These folks will run to John chapter 2. Which is really not something to smile about because it's blasphemous what they're teaching. And they'll make the case that what was happening here was our Lord and Savior engaging in the social consumption of alcohol. Well, when it comes to seeking God, when it comes to trying to find out what the truth is, we need to dig. Paul will tell Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, give diligence or study to show thyself approved unto God. Folks, we don't just take someone's word for it. And if we are studying a certain topic, we don't just go to one scripture and say, oh, that sounds about right. That's what I wanted to hear. Sounds good. Case closed. That's not seeking God. That's seeking my own will. So if there are those who want to seek their own will and want to try to justify social drinking, they can go to John chapter 2, isolate that passage in and of itself, but they're still not going to justify it they're still not going to be able to prove their argument, even within that own context. One of the things that we can always do when we're studying with someone is we can keep them right there in the context. Folks, the Bible never disagrees with itself. It's in complete harmony. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and verse 33. God has not in any way contradicted himself from the front end to the back end. It's all consistent. And so sometimes, as we're doing here tonight, we feel the need to run all over the place and literally go everywhere preaching the word. And I even struggled with putting this together because in a lot of ways, I wanted to really hunker down and stay glued to Proverbs 23, 29 through 35. Because I, I exegeted that passage. But we're going everywhere preaching the word, which is fine. But sometimes if we're studying with someone and they're trying to make a case, let's nail them down. 
Okay, let's go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Let's start there in verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Folks, the point is, that's a lot of capacity. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made, with, made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Folks, the ruler of the feast recognizes two things that we're going to take note of. Number one, the folks that were at the feast were already full. There was no need of good tasting wine any longer. They had had their fill regarding their liquid consumption. So anything that was added on top of what had already been consumed would have led to further intoxication. We're not talking about just a little bit of alcohol here. We're talking about folks that are in a state of fullness. They are filled, and now they are being given even more wine. This is not social drinking. This would be drunkenness. Notice, likewise, that the ruler is able to discern that the wine that he is drinking is indeed good. So if they had already drank to the point of fullness, if it was alcoholic, would not have been able to discern the very taste of that which they were drinking. But the ruler could discern. The ruler could recognize. In other words, the water had been turned into non-alcoholic wine. Now folks will say there, well, there's no such thing as non-alcoholic. Back in the first century, they didn't have coolers, they didn't have refrigerators, they didn't have technology. Well, first, let's start with the fact that what Jesus did, if it was alcoholic, was sinful. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 15. Likewise, the New Testament tells us, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, that Jesus did no sin. So right there, we have a complication. Right there, if that's the case, we can reject all of this. But see, that's not what folks are trying to do. They want a little bit of this. They want the areas of this book that they like. But then you start really grinding them down, and you start studying what this means, folks, the whole entire scripture falls to pieces. But guess what? That's not the case. Because Jesus didn't sin. And what he engaged in here wasn't sin. Because the water indeed was non-alcoholic, just like the wine that they drank before he converted the water into wine was non-alcoholic. How do we know that? Let's go to the book of Exodus. Exodus. Exodus chapter 13. You could also notice chapter 12, verses 19 and 20. But in Exodus chapter 13, very similar passage is given to us. In verse 7 there... We read the instructions regarding the Passover. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee, notice, in all thy quarters. Folks, when it comes to making alcohol, you cannot do it without leaven. For wine, grape juice, to convert to alcohol, alcoholic wine, yeast is a requirement. But here, we learn quite plainly that in order to observe the Passover and be acceptable in the sight of God, 
no leaven could be found in all of their corridors. That means the wine that they drank of during the Passover could not have leaven in it. It could not be alcohol. Well, preacher, then how did they keep it from fermenting? How is that possible? Folks, I think we have become so arrogant as a generation. Uh, and I'm in the midst of the generation, unfortunately, but they're everywhere. You know, the, the folks that, you know, you see, you know, like this all the time. You know, that's, that's my generation, unfortunately. But they think they're the only ones who have ever experienced communication in any level. They're the only ones who've ever figured anything out of a technological form. And as if all generations prior to theirs didn't have a clue as to what they were doing. Folks, there's nothing new under the sun. And refrigeration, figuring out a way to cool and preserve food, is something that has been needed since the very beginning of time. Now, maybe since after Noah. But we learn that the Passover had to have been kept with non-alcoholic wine. And in Luke chapter 22... As Jesus is desiring to eat the Passover with his disciples, verse 15, he then institutes the Lord's Supper, and it involves the fruit of the vine, verse 20. So we know that they had a way to obey and keep the commandment that no leaven, no alcoholic wine could be in their quarters, yet they're drinking here wine. So what does that mean? It is non-alcoholic. Now, we could stop there, and that's all we need to hear. But the reality is there's physical evidences. There's actually several ways, but we're just going to cover one of them because it's the easiest to, to comprehend and, and communicate. Have you ever been down to the very bottom of a stream or a creek? I haven't, but maybe a few times. Hannah's terrified of them, snakes and so forth, you know. But if you ever go down there, or if you've ever been down there, it's very, very cold usually throughout the year. Jerusalem, that area, Palestine, similar temperature, similar demographics weather-wise to us. So they would have, and they did, and there's physical evidences of such, bottled grape juice and then submerged it into water deep enough to where it was kept refrigerated. At which point then, when they needed it, they would pull it up and drink it. Henceforth, unfermented wine. But folks, guess what that just took? Now, it didn't take us very long. You, you might think it did. I don't know. But that didn't take us very long. But what did it require? It required seeking God. Is John chapter 2 really a case where our Lord was engaged in social drinking? And if we dig just a little deeper for just a few minutes, folks, it's so clear that it's not. But we have to be willing to seek the Lord. Is social drinking acceptable? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Alcohol is not wise from a social context. But alcohol is also not wise from a physical context. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. And notice with me here, beginning in verse 29 beginning in verse 29. As a matter of fact, mark that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6 again. 1 Corinthians 6. Remember how we get wisdom. Number one, we fear the Lord. We fear the Lord. Notice verse 13 in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Drop down to verse 19. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Folks, we are to, pres we are to dwell, we are to allow God's word, that which the Holy Spirit has taught us, to dwell within our bodies, being essentially the temple of the law of God. And we are to carry our bodies about, not from a physical sense, verse 13, but from a spiritual sense, remember, fearing the Lord. Now, drinking alcohol from a physical perspective oftentimes 
The argument is made, well, I just need to relax my muscles a little bit. I just need to, you know, burn off just the difficulties of the day and just kick back. Folks, our body is not our own. When we made the decision to obey the gospel, we died to ourselves and are to live in Christ. Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 3. We don't own ourselves anymore. We don't have the mindset of, well, I just need to feel better. My muscles need to feel better. I'm going to just enjoy a drink. No, folks, that's not having a fearful mindset, recognizing who owns our body and who we're to be using it for, the Lord. But also, when it comes to hearing God's word, we see that physically, alcohol is the wrong thing to do. Go back with me now to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23, beginning there in verse 29. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? We could stop right there. Does this sound like something that's physically beneficial? <clears throat> Verse 30, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Oh, so the folks that are suffering from those physical ailments, they're engaged in drinking alcohol. Verse 31, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Folks, it is poisonous. It is poisonous. Now, are you going to make brownies with rat poison mixed in to the flour? No. No. Are you going to play around with copperheads who have the capability of biting and injecting venom, which is actually the idea here, into your bloodstream, causing physical ailments right off the bat? No. But yet when it comes to wine, when it comes to alcohol, sometimes we don't go to God's word to hear what it has to say. Everything that we're given right here, everything that's been given to us tells us we need to stay away from it. Notice verse 31. Don't even look at it. Stay clear. Physically speaking, when it comes to fearing the Lord, when it comes to hearing what his word has to say, Alcohol is not wise. It is to be avoided. What about when it comes to seeking the Lord? Well, sometimes folks will get the idea that, you know, I just serve the Lord better when I'm not stressed out. Folks, Hannah and I have learned that stress is irrelevant. I mean, I mean, it's, it's a fact. It's going to happen. You're going to be stressed. And God has in no way told us otherwise especially as his children. In no way has God ever said, become a Christian and you won't have another care the rest of your life. We actually have more care than most folks. And so folks will actually make the argument, well, in order for me to seek the Lord, I, you know, I just need to you know, just burn off some stress and just kick back and enjoy a drink. Is that what God's word tells us to do? To get rid of the cares that we have in this life. As a matter of fact, it's dealt with in the very context of drinking. 1 Peter chapter 5. In verse 7 there, Peter writes, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. God says you have cares, you give them to me. Verse 8, be sober. <laughs> be sober. To abstain from intoxicants to keep the mind cleansed and pure in order to make appropriate judgment. Be sober. God says, when you have cares, you cast them upon me and you be sober. When it comes to seeking the Lord, folks, alcohol is not the place to go. But our needs, prayer, is the place to go. Finally this evening, we're going to cover some practical issues. Some practical issues. How, how can we steer clear of alcohol? We understand the scripture. Alcohol is something we should not be engaging in as a Christian. To be faithful to the Lord, we should stay away from it. But how do we prep ourselves? How do we live 
in such a way so that when those temptations come about, we appropriately answer to them. Well, number one, we must protect our eyes. We must protect our eyes. In Proverbs chapter 23, our eyes and our mind, our surroundings, we need to keep them protected. Proverbs chapter 23, and in verse 7 there, Solomon writes, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Folks, if we are going to try to live a life avoiding alcohol, the last thing we need to be doing is filling our mind with music, shows, movies, events, where nothing but alcohol is surrounding our minds. Because it's only a matter of time when we become numb to the scriptures we've gone to and we begin to think that, oh, all that Satan is putting before us just like he told Eve in the garden. Just like Eve recognized in the garden. In Genesis chapter 3, she saw that the fruit was pleasant to the eyes. All of a sudden, we then begin to think, well, maybe alcohol isn't that bad. Look at all these funny commercials. Look at all these movies. I mean, these folks, they're, they're living the, the good life. That's not the good life. That's not the Christian life. So we must protect our minds. We also must pass by. Pass by. Notice chapter 5 and verse 8 of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 8. This is in the context of a strange woman, but it could still apply, and it can apply to any sin. Notice what is being commanded here of his son. Remove thy way far from her. Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 8. And come not nigh the door of her house. Folks, strolling around downtown Athens at 1130 at night with nothing to do is not wise. We're not keeping our feet away from alcohol. We're going and involving ourselves all around it. And then it's only a couple weekends before all of a sudden what we knew begins to fade away. Uh, begins to fade away. Notice also what John writes in 3 John verse 11. Uh, imitate not evil. Stay away from evil. Uh, we don't need to be concerned with trying to keep up with our co-workers and friends and other folks that are you know, going to the race this, e this weekend, going to the game that weekend, coming over for parties, and we know what they're doing. We don't need to be concerned with imitating their lifestyle. We need to prefer one another, as, Pro as uh, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12. We don't need to be concerned with keeping up with them. Finally, we need to prepare ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves. Go with me Proverbs chapter 22. If you're going to take anything with you tonight, this is it. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 3. And I hope you didn't take just this from it. Not because of me, because of the scriptures. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. Uh, I don't see too many young people in here. Of course, our children are in here. I see a few children in here. Some young folks are in here. Young, old, middle-aged, it doesn't matter. Folks, in doing what we are to do in this life, we're going to come across situations where we are tempted with alcohol. But if we are wise and if we foresee the evil ahead of time, we can prepare ourselves so that we can have a different direction, we can have an answer, we can have a route whereby we can remain faithful to the Lord and steer clear of temptation. I was in a conference earlier this year in the city of Chicago. Not the most moral of cities whatsoever. And unfortunately, not the most moral of conferences. But you know what? As I began to look at the schedule and as I began to see that certainly alcohol was going to be a tenant, heavily involved throughout this, I began to plot which lectures, which classes, which demonstrations I was going to hear and when it was time to leave. The man who's not prudent, the man who doesn't see the evil coming, the man who's not concerned and just floats about like a lily, 
all of a sudden is going to allow himself to wind up into situations where he is getting tempted. And unfortunately, sometimes the case is that's the way they want it to be. So that maybe Satan can work on them just a little bit so that over time they can figure out a way to justify it. Folks, if we're going to practically apply what we've learned to lot, uh, tonight, we need to protect our minds, we need to pass by, and we need to prepare ourselves ahead of time to avoid the temptation of alcohol. If you look at Proverbs 23, 29 through 35, when you look at all the outcomes, all the consequences of drinking in that text, it's pretty hard to be wise in all these other categories when you've allowed your mind to become polluted, you've allowed your body to become harmed to where you can't have a good marriage, you can't have a good work ethic, you can't have proper speech, you can't be a proper parent. You can't be a proper friend. Because alcohol has entered the picture. Wisdom and alcohol. The Bible has a great deal to teach us on the matter. If you're here tonight, brother or sister, and you need to repent, you need to come home. Maybe this lesson has been a wake-up call. Maybe you need prayers for other folks that you care about and love. Maybe you need to be restored.